Did the best. Well, anyway, we're, we're, talking we're talking about a different about? character. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Bill Watson. Bill, this this name is in in a group of books that I've been reading, and they say that this is the name of one of the thieves. Wow. One of the two thieves, Dismas. But that's it. It's not in the Bible. Are you talking about? Oh, really? One okay. Of They're not named. Because the one that was going to crucify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the yeah. Bible, they're not named. There's one oh, Catholic yeah, I didn't think they were, but yeah. the character in the, in the story says so he was one of the thieves. Yeah, was he a good thief or the one that stayed unrepentant? <laughs> they, don't, they don't say that. <laughs> oh. So he dismissed Jesus.
we're just going to have one of those kind of mornings. That sounds a little better. <laughs> okay, whether you're a first-time visitor or this is your lifelong faith journey home, we're glad to have you here today, and we welcome you in Facebook land. You may join us with the by standing and singing the Star Spangled Banner. you later. <laughs> This is the point the music starts or the drum begins to play. headquarters. The call to worship is printed in your bulletin. God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the skies, our grateful songs before thy throne arise. Thy love divine has led us in the past. In this free land by thee our lot is cast. Be thou our ruler, guardian, guide, and stay. Thy word our law, thy paths our chosen way. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine. And glory, laud, and praise be ever thine. Amen. Now can they be seated? Nope. It says Dan. Dan. Okay, please stay standing. <laughs> I'm, I'm Irish, I'm not German, so <laughs> rules are optional. I'm German. I know. <laughs> We're going to sing America the Beautiful. What number is that? Thanks. This is what they call a pregnant pause. <laughs>
Joe's going to come and pray if you would like to sit. <laughs> you can sit and bow your heads in for prayer. Most gracious God, on this holiday weekend, we're celebrating our great country. We give you thanks for this beautiful word, world that you have given us. Forgive us that we not, have not always taken good care of your creation. Guide us in ways to preserve and protect this land of the free and home of the brave in the future. Thank you for strong and faithful leaders of the past and our armed forces. We live in a divided world. We see suffering, pain, violence, and uh, injustices. Help us to walk with you during times of trouble. Open our eyes to the needs of those around us. Help us to show your love, God. We have found that her churches aren't always perfect. Open our hearts and give us wisdom to follow the way of love Jesus taught us when he said to love God and love your neighbors as yourself. Let the people of Roseland United Methodist Church listen to the way God speaks to us, guides us, and saves us. Help us to trust you in difficult times. May we take the hardships and make something good from the pain, suffering, and injustices of the past. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus. And now, now let us pray the prayer that he taught us. Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in singing a mighty fortress.
that will fell all the big and little devils in your life is Jesus. Jesus. Wow. Fourth of July. You know what that means? Freedom! Yeah, yeah, yeah. William Wallace. Remember him? Uh, Braveheart. Um, it also means, Lisa and I have been here a year. <laughs> this is the weekend we joined you last year. So some of you are like, all right. Some of you are like, really? It's only been a year? <laughs> On this Independence Weekend, let's begin our message with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads? God, we declare that all the glory belongs to you and you alone. We declare that our strength is found in you and you alone. For you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I pray that the reality of this truth would settle into each of us here, in this room and beyond, on the world wide web. Father, I ask that through the Holy Spirit you create a peace, a freedom within each of us that can only come from a dependence upon you and the work of your Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, on Calvary's cross, and the resurrection and the life that is to come for those who will trust and obey. And all God's kids said, Amen. One nation under who? We're going to talk about the reality of that truth. That as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a collection of churches, as a nation, God wants to bless us, but there is one thing God cannot bless. What do you suppose that is? Sin. Open rebellion against God. Does does that mean that he hates individuals that miss the mark, which is what sin is, ha martia? Uh, When I miss the mark, which is several times an hour, do you think God moves from love to hate, love to hate, love to hate? Do you think that's how it works? So God continues to love us. But God will not accept our sin. It doesn't matter whether we individually or every human on the planet tells God it's not sin. If God says it's sin, guess what it is? Sin. Does that mean God no longer loves you? No. He does love you, but God cannot bless sin. So be careful when you buy into a set of choices that cause God to remove his hand of protection, his hedge that is called a blessing or the anointing of the Holy Spirit because God cannot protect, will not hedge against the consequences of sin. We're in a series that we're calling blind spots. We're looking at four or five emotional blind spots and uh, it's true that these blind spots pretty much blend together. Uh, let, Let me make my point. There was a dad cruising down the interstate when he noticed in his mirror uh, a, a little red dot. And then he looked again, and it was much closer. He looked again, and he couldn't see it because it was passing him. And it happened to be a red convertible with a young woman in it, and the top on the car wasn't the only thing that was down. He was shocked, and he had his little boy in the back seat. So he prayed a quick prayer. Oh, Lord, please don't let him see that. It's too soon to have that talk. And he thought he got away with it. And suddenly a little voice from the back seat said, Dad, did you see that? And he goes, oh, Lord. He says, no, son, see what? He says, that lady wasn't wearing a (laughs) seatbelt. You see, he was sitting low enough in his car seat that she was in his blind spot. Once in a while, you want to give God the praise and the glory for a blind spot. Amen? Amen. There's a lot that's going on in this world that I just don't want to see anymore. There's a lot that's going on in this world that's changing and probably too fast for me. Some of it is probably good, but much of it is contrary to God's word. And for those of my friends who think that we are writing the next chapter in the new gospel of Jesus Christ, I would challenge you to listen to this story about arrogance, the story about the Old Testament character called Samson. 
You see, in this look at our emotional blind spots, last week we looked at anger. Do you remember who we looked at? Who's the guy holding the rock? Who's the guy about to get bonked and is totally clueless? Abel. So when we talk about the emotional blind spot of anger, the bottom line is you need to acknowledge your anger. You need to, well, you know, God, I'm disappointed. God, I'm, I'm uh, you know, feeling threatened here. I'm afraid. God, I'm just absolutely ticked off. I can't believe somebody drive down the road like that. Just what's wrong with her? What, what's wrong with her parents, you know? And then so you get yourself all worked up, and then you say, but I'm not mad. Really? You're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what the answer, I'm fine, leads to? A crash. Physically on the highway, well, I can see, really, the fact is that uh, you've been told not to drive at night. It's on your driver's license, but, you know, what is the rule to me? So I drive anyway. Why? Because it's a convenience. And I don't want to inconvenience anybody else, so I dress it up. I don't want to follow rules, including the rules that come out of God's word to help us live better individual lives and better lives together. So when you experience a strong emotion, acknowledge it. And then find the root cause. This all comes from uh, the primary verse last week, which is, in your anger, do not what? Don't let the anger, or the sun set on your what? Your anger. God wants to work through all of your emotions, including your strong emotions, but you get to do the digging. So find the root cause. Why am I afraid? What is it What is that is triggered inside of me because of something you did or didn't do? Uh, the truth is, anger is always an inside job. Did you know that? Always. You made me so angry. No. You're responding to whatever they did or didn't do. You were the one making you angry. I've taught this many times, and I'm sure I've taught it here. It is what it is. It will be what you make of it. You see, facts are facts. And then you process those facts, no matter where it is in your life, and then you decide how you're going to feel about it. Sometimes you can choose to just be confused. You know, I don't really get why they're doing that. Or you can choose to be angry. Find the root cause. And the root cause is inside of you. It's not inside of someone else. And the devil's not making you do it either. But he knows which buttons to push in you and the right sequence to get you to launch. Don't give Satan that kind of power because it will lead. It will lead to a place of death. Physical, relational, emotional, financial, where you just act in a rash fashion and somehow the world within you or around you is a less than reality. It is what it is. It'll be what you make of it. So deal with it as soon as possible. As soon as possible. But you have to play the hand that you have been dealt. So this weekend isn't anger. This weekend is arrogance. Arrogance. Um, I don't want you to name anybody personally, so don't give like Bob Jones or whatever. But can you think of somebody who comes to mind when you think of the word arrogance? Who are some of the, not individual names, but categories of people? Like, I don't know, pitchers, for example, if you're on a baseball team. They, they tend to think they're the captain of the team, even if they're not, okay? Uh, who else tends to be arrogant? Engineers. And then she's going to say Air Force, and then she's going to say Preachers, and then she's going to just, okay, who else besides me? Politicians can certainly be arrogant. Who else? Cops can be arrogant. Yeah, yeah. Not police officers, but cops, right? Okay, who else can be arrogant? Doctors, lawyers, who else? I think Lisa's got it, not just because she's my wife. Everybody can be arrogant. We can. Most people are not arrogant in their, stru- in their weaknesses. They're arrogant in their what? Strengths. Well, you know, I have got a Ph.D. from Harvard, and my master's is, is from Yale. You know what? I won't go into the old joke about BSMS and Ph.D. But, 
So sometimes education can make us feel like we know better than other people. Sometimes experience can make us arrogant. Here's an insight that you may not have recognized yet. Just because it worked for you doesn't necessarily mean it works for everybody else. Does that make sense? Uh, you know, one of the things I remember when I first started ministry at Pasadena Community Church, which was a large church, it's still fairly large, but we had people come down in droves because it was a regional church. It's where J. Wallace Hamilton, that was his preaching station. So every year we'd, uh, we'd just flush out during season from people from all over the country, not just from the New England area. And they would always want to tell us how they did it back north. You know, well, you know, back in my church up, up in uh, Indiana, I'll pick on Indiana just because it's safe. Okay, back in my church in Indiana, that's not what we used to do. We used to do this. Well, how big was your church in Indiana? Oh, about 50 on Sunday. We have 110 in the choir. That's not going to work here, okay? Just because it worked for you. So it's not just education, it's experience. Everything you know is not universal. So be humble. Hold your truth in an open hand. Because as soon as you close your hand, you have a what? A fist. Truth doesn't need to be defended. A lie requires a defense. So be open and honest. Be in an open and honest dialogue with people who agree with you and also with people who don't agree with you. Otherwise, the object in the mirror is a lot closer than it appears. It's called arrogance. Arrogance. So, again, we're looking at the Old Testament, these, these characters who kind of epitomize each of these emotional blind spots. And when you're talking about arrogance, the Old Testament character that comes to mind for me is a guy named Samson. Samson. Now, everybody thinks of the end of his story. Uh, who was the, the, the last woman in Samson's uh, entourage? He, he was a serial polygamist, by the way. Um, so who was the last? I say Samson, you immediately think of Delilah. La, 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 Delilah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she wasn't the first. <laughs> he started out as a young man, and he was pretty doggone arrogant. But let's, let's step backwards and give you the meat of the story that most Christians, even adult Christians, have never really considered. So let's begin with Judges 13.1. Just listen. Again, the Israelites did what? Evil in whose sight? You know, this phrase occurs over and over again from Genesis to Revelation. It's this idea, that, and it shows up in two different ways, but it's the exact same issue. It's pride. I know better than God, okay? So we do evil in the eyes of the Lord or we do what seems right in our own eyes. And so it appears in those two forms hundreds of times from Genesis to Revelation and it happens in each of our lives, believe it or not. Uh, if you come up to a red light, what are you supposed to do? And if you don't, what might happen? Yeah, you might meet somebody by accident, right? But, but listen, listen, listen. Just So it's like the guy... He, he needed a ride home from work, so he took a ride with a guy who was a little sketchy, but he worked with him. He figured, how bad could it be? Uh, they're driving along. They come up to a red light. What are you supposed to do at a red light? He didn't. He hit the gas. <laughs> he looked at him, and he says, what's wrong with you? That light was red. And he says, I know. I know. Uh, he said, well, who taught you to drive? Well, my brother did. Okay. And about that time, they come to another light. And it's red. What do you suppose he did? He hit the gas again. And the guy, you're out of your mind. I'll never ride with you again anywhere. You're going to get us both killed. They come to a green light. You know what he did? He hit the brakes. And he says, what are you doing? Somebody's going to hit us from behind. He says, are you kidding? My brother may be coming the other direction. <laughs> Rules legitimate. Righteous rules exist for our benefit and the benefit of others. Your rights end where? The tip of your nose. So do theirs. And everything in between our noses is called relationships. And we codify those relationships in things called rules, in things called laws. So we are supposed to be aware of the rules, 
And as long as the rule doesn't violate common sense, as long as it doesn't violate God's law, then you should be a law-abiding citizen. Does that make sense? Oh, that was weak. What have I got a bunch of lawless vigilantes in here? (laughs) It says again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of Philistines, a foreign nation. For how long? That's a long time. And during this time, God brought a new judge, a new deliverer, a new hero into the nation to defeat the Philistines. But he wasn't this purebred hero that you might hope him to be. He was a lot like you and me. So Samson is a story about ignorance, about ignorance. Um, If you don't understand that God's hand of blessing, that God's hedge of protection is around the righteous, but he will not protect, he will not bless unrighteousness. He cannot. It doesn't mean that he stopped loving you. He simply is not going to bless the evil that you choose to perpetrate in your life or upon the lives of others. So it says again. So what do you know about that? It tells you that something like it happened before. So it's happening again. There is this cycle that's common to all men. And uh, we're going to call this cycle, um, sometimes I call it sin of repentance. Today we're going to call it pride and arrogance. You see, by and large, if you are living your life in a way that honors God, that gives glory to God, that doesn't, isn't all about you, it's not selfish. You have to take care of yourself and your family, but you still care about others and you don't actively seek the destruction of your enemies. So if you're living a righteous life, then you are at the top of this cycle. Things are going pretty good. You're getting the blessing of God. If you're doing it really good, maybe the anointing of God where amazing things are happening that you know just shouldn't be happening, but God is opening heaven's coffers into your life. You're in a period of righteousness and prosperity. That happens for individuals. It happens for families. It happens for churches, communities, nations. It happens for the world. But we are human. And when things are going good, do we tend to get better towards God or fall away from God? We tend to fall away. We begin to think that, well, you know, um, all this financial blessing is my life because I chose to get an education in engineering. (laughs) And uh, I got a good job, and I've saved, and I've worked, and I've sort of done the church thing on the side. So we think it's kind of because of what we did. So we begin to lose sight that all God's blessings come into our life in very tangible ways. So we're living this life of prosperity and righteousness, but we begin to fall away. We begin to think that it's because of me. It's because of my family. It's because of my church. It's because of my country. And so we begin to move away from where God would have us. We begin to become prideful. We begin to become wicked. They began to do evil in the sight of the Lord. They began to do what they thought was right in their sight. So we move from this place of God's blessing. doesn't mean God loves us any less. God didn't move. We did. We changed zip codes. And we fall into pride and wickedness. And that leads to consequences, destruction and suffering. We had the privilege of working with a couple of kids this week, uh, staying at home to help their parents out. And uh, I kept saying over and over again to both of them, one is two and one's almost four. And over and over again, They'd have a little mini meltdown. You ever been with a three-year-old that had a meltdown? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a power struggle. It's this idea that somehow if I express my anger long enough or loud enough that you are going to give me my way. Does that sound familiar? Don't you hate it when they're 40 years old and doing the same thing? (laughs) So there is. I found myself over and over saying, use your words. Use your words. Your emotions confuse me. And you know you say, well, a three-year-old doesn't get that, but you know what? They do. And so pretty soon the wine would go away and they would begin to use their words. And I'm like, score, this stuff really works. (laughs) So, but there are consequences. Consequences in your marriage. Consequences in your finances. Consequences in your health. Consequences. And, And they don't always, they're not always immediate. I've got a good friend who quit smoking 40 years ago, and guess what they have now? Lung cancer. 
You say, oh man, they've been 40 years righteous, but the seeds were sown. And so it's not as bad if they continued to smoke right up. They'd probably already be dead. But here's the deal. This cycle doesn't care what your name is. This cycle doesn't care who you think you are. This cycle is universal and is not breakable. We live in a place of righteousness and blessing by God, but we do things, all of us do things. And a lot of times we don't do them intentionally. We, we don't do them maliciously. We just act selfishly. And then the seeds of our destruction are sown and we live with the consequences. But then, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a person of faith, hard times should drive you to your knees. Oh, Lord! What can I learn? What is my takeaway from this difficulty? Oh, Lord. Maybe it's simply this. Trust in me. Trust that I'll get you through this. Even if it isn't the outcome that you're praying for, I will never leave nor forsake you. So you back away from telling God what God must do to accepting that God will get you through the next minute, the next hour, the next week, the next month. You see this cycle? God's blessing, we begin to take for granted and act in self-centered, selfish ways, our pride and our wickedness that leads to consequences. And hopefully, you don't become angry with God. Hopefully, you don't, as so many people have done, they begin to say, well, there must not be a God because God's not doing it my way. That's that 40-year-old who's getting all emotional instead of just using their words. I feel abandoned. I feel hurt. I feel like God is punishing me. And then you go to wise counsel and they go, do you really think God's punishing you? Do you think maybe this is a consequence of yours or someone else's action or inaction? Do you think God, out of all the people on the planet, focused on you and said you are going to have to suffer for this? Most of our suffering is self-induced. Most of our suffering is self-induced individually or collectively as a society. How many of you remember the ads on TV in the 1970s with the Cherokee Indian sitting there on a hill overlooking a pollution, a smog-covered valley, and there's a tear rolling down his face. How many of you know that we've cleaned that up? How many of you know, remember the time the river that runs through Pittsburgh caught on fire? How many of you know we've cleaned that up? The cycle is real, individually and collectively. We need to act responsibly towards God, first and foremost, towards others, secondly, and also towards ourselves. If you choose to damage your body through whatever sinful lifestyle, it's on you. God's not going to love you less. I can't condemn you, but you're condemning yourself physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. It's on us. It says, again, Israel fell into sin. You can choose to live your life any way you want to. It's your right. It is, and God will not take that right away from you. God won't turn you from a human being into a rock. You can choose to live your life your way. But read this with me. Here is the promise of God that I hope you'll claim. Read it. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. How many of you want to be strong? Wouldn't you like to be strong physically and relationally, financially, physically? Yes, we choose to be strong if we choose to get our strength from the Lord. In other words, to live in God's way. If we choose to align ourselves with God's will, there is a strength in that lifestyle. And it doesn't matter that nobody else in your family, nobody else in your community or church or nation is choosing to follow you in that lifestyle. It is God's ordained choice. So, you know, today, marriage between one man and one woman is quickly becoming one of many options. And I've got family and friends that are living in gay and lesbian lifestyle, and the truth is God loves them, and I love them. One of the saddest things that I'll carry to my grave, my sister Lynn is one of the most beautiful and intelligent women I've ever known. And she'll never have a child. You can't tell me there's not consequences to a lesbian lifestyle. There is. But I've got other friends that are heterosexual. And they have chosen, for whatever reason, to not have children. Some of them, times, infertility is something that's thrust upon a couple who desperately want a child. That's why I'm hoping, as we rethink this abortion issue, I'm hoping what we'll do is we'll connect the hundreds of thousands of infertile couples who desperately want a child with the hundreds of 
thousands of young women who are afraid of their pregnancy. So instead of throwing rocks, instead of making these infertile couples feel less than, we connect the supply chain that's there from God and connect. There is no one unwanted pregnancy. There may be a family or a woman who doesn't want a child, but that child is wanted by God. That child, if you trust in the path of God, God has already prepared a home, a heart that desperately wants them. So if the church wants to be helpful in this debate, get off the pro-life, pro-choice nonsense and get into the pro-Jesus movement and connect need with need and suddenly we have a ministry that will empower everybody and give life to a child that just may be the one who cures cancer, just may be the one who breaks through in our next technology. Why would we choose an alternate path? It says if we choose this path, the way of the Lord, then we will do what? Soar on wings like eagles. Have you ever seen a hummingbird? You ever seen their, their wings? Then they're beating themselves to death to try to stay in the air. Does an eagle do that? No, that's why it picks the eagle as our symbol. The eagle looks for the wind and then adjusts and catches the next updraft. He didn't create the wind. He's not beating his wings. He's looking for the wind that's there and then adjusts for it, sort of like sailing. That's what life is meant to be when lived in the Christ. You're not beating your wings. You're not trying to do it better than, than your neighbor. What you're trying to do is see where God is leading you in this conversation, in this crisis, leading you in your day-to-day doldrum life. Where is God at work? And then you join God in that work. It says they'll run and not grow weary. I can't run to the refrigerator without taking a break. You know, and I trust in the Lord. And, and they will walk and not be what? Faint. You are free to live any way that you choose. And God will let you do that. But God can only bless the righteous choices. doesn't mean he loves you less. It means he loves you enough to let you go. So those who know the Lord, those that know his teaching and live as best they can according to his teaching, have hope in the Lord, a hope beyond your circumstance. And that hope gives you the strength that you need to face your challenges. Uh, something's happening in the church. It happens every it happens all the time. And again, Israel fell into the fault. I want to give you a $10 term, syncretism. Uh, can you say that? Syncretism. I don't think it's an accident. That when, a, when a ship fills with water, it does what? I don't think this is an accident. <laughs> syncretism. Uh, it's basically two worldviews, two or more worldviews, or two or more religious worldviews, uh, are blended together. That's what syncretism is. You kind of put them in a pot, stir them together, and it's a little of this, a little of that. Um, when you take a, the biblical worldview, which is what's revealed here, and you mix it with other worldviews, which is all around us, we call that culture, and other religions, and then you mix them together, and every generation, well, every generation does it, but in every generation, uh, we think that we've come up with a new and better way. It's sort of like uh, the latest iPhone. There's no really difference between the last iPhone, but it comes in blue. Woo! All right, so we think it's a progressive worldview. And really what it is, it's an adulterated biblical view when we're talking about the Christian community. Um, let's see. So this is where they're at. It's not just a 21st century Christian thing, but it is what we're experiencing right now. Uh, it just is. All right? But this is what happened in Israel. Israel had been conquered by the Philistines, and uh, God, it says God, because of their sin, gave them over for 40 years underneath the Philistine, uh, the Philistine rule. Um, but the Philistines, the way they conquered is through assimilation. Assimilation. Any Star Trek fans? Anybody know who the Borg are? They're this race from some far sector of the galaxy that, that takes over other races and simply assimilates them. They take the distinctives from whatever planet, whatever culture, and assimilates it into their collective. And does anybody remember their, um, their catchphrase that they always say? Resistance is futile. Is futile. No, it's not! 
Jean-Luc Picard stood up against it, and they finally ended that nonsense. Well, science fiction is also fact in our life. Resist. Understand the biblical worldview so that you can see where the syncretism is taking place, where you can see, well, you know, you're free to be whatever you want to be. My rights end at the tip of your nose, and we can be in dialogue about your worldview, but at the end of the day, I'm going to stand on the B-I-B-L-E. Anybody with me? Amen. Amen. So it doesn't mean I'm not going to care. It doesn't mean I'm not going to listen to your understanding, but it's going to be a hard sell to get me to move from a traditional, classical, Christian worldview. Uh, so Israel was conquered through assimilation, uh, cultural indoctrination. You know where the cultural indoctrination has been happening here for the last 50 years? W- what are the primary means of it? What is changing our culture? Social media has accelerated it immensely. You know, right now, if I've espoused traditional Judeo-Christian uh, sexual and marriage, Uh, uh, expectations Uh, it's just short of hate speech and it will be at hate speech before too long including inside of the church I just I can't believe (laughs) where we've come and that's how quickly we've gone but uh, Hollywood Madison Avenue we have been groomed our education system has groomed us to uh, we focus on uh, not being judgmental But that basically means that your judgment based on God's word is now considered hate. And it's not just allow you to choose as God allows everybody to choose. Unless you agree that it's good, then you are a hateful person. You are a judgmental person. I cannot believe how quickly the United States has come to this point. So that's where Israel was. They had intermarried. They adopted, blended in their culture with the Philistinian culture. Um... But God raised up a champion. He always does. I'm convinced that God is raising up men and women inside of the church of Jesus Christ today to stand against the tide, to resist. And it will not be futile. So God raises up a hero named Samson. Here's how it happened. Manoah's wife was unable to become pregnant. We don't know whether it was a guy's fault or the woman's fault biologically, uh, but they were infertile, okay? Okay. Uh, So the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for while he he will be dedicated to the Lord as a Nazarite from birth. So see, in the 60s, I didn't cut my hair. I was just trying to be a Nazarite. No, just kidding. (laughs) Uh, Read the last sentence with me, would you? He will rescue Israel from the Philistines. Forty years, this time... Uh, God is raising up a new judge in the land called Samson. He's been identified as a heroic figure from birth. Number six, Numbers chapter six tells us more about this Nazarite vow. And uh, verses three and four, it says you can't drink alcohol, including wine, fruit of the vine. And then in verse five, it says you can't cut your hair. Anybody ever seen an Amish person with a beard? Yeah, it's great unless you see their eggs from breakfast and it's not so good. All right, and then verses 6 and 7 of number 6 says that you can't touch dead bodies. Can't touch dead bodies. If everybody who's a person of faith in Israel subject to the Nazarite vow, no, just those who have agreed. We had an infant baptism this morning. We baptized this child. Um, hit a white wall. Gianna. Uh, and uh, her family stood up and said, we will help her learn the ways of Christ so that when she is old enough, she will profess her faith openly herself. So this, again, the Amish community. Uh, Do you know what the the ritual is? Uh, You have the Amish and they think everybody else is English. Uh, That's just what they call us. doesn't matter whether you're German. Uh, We're just English to them. Um, They, at the age of 16, before they take their baptismal vows, uh, which says they're going to live by the rules of the church, before that, they allow them to go out and experience life as an English. You ever heard of that? Do you know what it's called? Rumspringa. Exactly. Rumspringa. Man, they're sowing their wild oats. You ever see a picture of a young Amish girl with a little white hat and, a, you know, the plain dress, and then she's got a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other? That makes you go, what? 
uh, she's letting her hair down. She wants to find out. And most of them, by the way, do come back to their Amish roots. They come back in to the community. They've experienced the syncretism. They've experienced the English worldview, and it is radically different from the worldview that they came up with. Um, Samson is full of pride. He's arrogant. And in his arrogant, uh, his insecurity shows time and time again. He's very thin-skinned. Um, you know, he gets angry in this story over and over again, and when he gets angry, he lashes out, much like a two-year-old. Use your words, Samson, not your emotions. He never gets that. So in his arrogance and anger, uh, and anger his insecurities on display. He takes the jawbone of what kind of an animal? Do you remember? A donkey. No, he was the ass. But anyway, <laughs> he takes the jawbone of a donkey, which we all learned as an ass, uh, and he kills a thousand Philistine soldiers. Do you remember at the end of his story, he's brought out as a, on display in the temple of, uh, uh, not Beelzebub, that's somebody else I was talking this week, uh, Dagon. And he's strapped between the, the, the two pillars in this temple. Do you remember what he does? But he does it on God's strength. You know, his strength has left him because the Lord abandons this kind of pride. But he humbles himself and he receives receive the strength again and he pulls it down. He is strong. If anybody never needed to feel insecure, he's got the blessing of God. He's got the strength of Hercules. And yet he's insecure. Most of us act in our arrogance and pride because we're insecure. Um, Samson's blind spots show up very quickly in his story. And it does in our lives as well. The odds are the sin that you struggle with today revealed itself in your teen years. <coughs> it just happens to be for me, arrogance, pride is one of my issues that God has to constantly uh, work with me on. So one of the things that arrogance does is it blinds us to wise counsel. Uh, he, the Bible says in Judges 14, 1, he says, Samson went down to Timnah. Timnah is a Philistine city. So it's not just a question of geography. He went down to Timnah. It's also a statement, Samson went slumming. He went where God told him not to go. He went into the heart of the enemy. And the truth is, just like in that cycle we talked about, when you choose to act in an unrighteous fashion, there are consequences. And a lot of times those consequences appear very enticing. So while he's down in this Philistine city, while he's in Timnah, he sees a young woman there. And in Samson's eyes, she is hot. So he goes back home and he says, Mom, Dad, I saw a woman and she is amazing. She's just the one God has picked for me. Isn't it amazing how we throw God in the mix of our sin? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just exactly what I know God wants me to do. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at men. I said, I guarantee God's not telling you to enter into an adulterous relationship. I, I don't care. Uh, that is mixing something else in this pot called being a husband. So he went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. God had told them and is still telling us that we are not to intermarry with pagans. Deuteronomy 7 is where he tells Israel, you are in, in a, a, a land where people have different habits. They have different cultures. Uh, and you're going to have to live in the world but not become part of the world. Uh, still true today, the best marriages are between people of faith. But I have been with and I have many friends where we have a believer and a non-believer yoked together in marriage. We have a Christian and a Jew yoked together in marriage. The only one you have problems with usually is with a Baptist and a Methodist, but that's a different story. <laughs> Just kidding. Just make sure you know that's a joke. <clears throat> but the best marriages are between people of faith. Some of the hardest conversations I've had, sometimes they've ended good, sometimes they've ended hard, is with women who know their husband is not saved. And so they sick the preacher on them. And I sit down and I talk with them. I, you know, I walk them several. I walk through the case for a creator because they don't believe there's a God, the case for Christ because they don't understand who Jesus is. And many times I will lead them to Christ. But many times I don't. And the, the truth is that God is a gracious gentleman. God won't force you 
to believe in the salvation that comes only through the work of Christ on Calvary's cross. So the women agonize, and I've not yet had it with a man. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I've not had it. How can I be happy in heaven, Pastor, if I know my husband is in hell? I don't have an answer for that. Never stop trying. Always keep reaching. The Apostle Paul tells us if you're unequally yoked, if faith is married to non-faith, the Apostle Paul says you may lead them to Christ. Don't stop trying. You and I know from experience that bad character corrupts what? Bad company corrupts what? (laughs) Good character. Uh, They are more likely to lead you astray, and I've seen that time and time again. Where the default is the lowest common denominator, so if they don't believe, pretty soon you will not believe or practice your faith. So his mom and dad replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? And he said, Who are you to tell me what's good for me? Me and God are good, and God says, wow, she's hot. So I want her. Go and get her for me. Don't you love an arrogant son? But this is exactly what happens. Read this story for yourself. So he's dismissive and defiant to his parents, someone trying to give him wise counsel. Uh, The question for you and for me, are you open to wise counsel? Who helps you check your blind spot of arrogance where you just think you know? But in fact, you don't really know. But his parents give in to Samson. They go down to Timnah. And on the way down, Samson, without his parents present, is attacked by a lion. Did I mention that Samson happens to be pretty strong? So in the pictures of him getting attacked by the lion, you always see him grabbing him by the jaws and just (laughs) kind of tearing him in half. He kills the lion. Okay, so put that in your pocket. That's what happens. Um, And then he goes down, he meets the girl. You know, he didn't even met her. It's like a dating application. What are some of the dating apps out there? And I've had some good friends that I've married that have met through a dating app, by the way. But it can make it a little awkward on the first date when, you know, they've posted a picture and they look 30 years longer, younger and 50 pounds lighter. Um, But so he's never even met her. And now he goes down with his parents They meet, and he goes, yes, this is it. This is exactly the one that I I want. So they go back home. Then sometime later, when he went back to marry her, you know, had his heart set on this girl, he turned aside to look at what? Yeah. Do you ever do that? When we go back to cities we've lived in, we drive by places we live. Do you ever do that? I don't know what it is inside of me. Oh, yeah, I grew up there. The kids are like, Dad, we know this is like the 100th visit, okay? No, you were, you were in first grade here in this house. Dad, we know this is like the 100th visit. So there's something inside of us that goes back and visits past experiences. So he turns aside, and he still hasn't told his parents about this lion's carcass, uh, this victory over the lion. Uh, and guess what he does? He sees a swarm of bees. It's been a while, so a swarm of bees has built a hive in there, and the honey looks good. Do you remember his Nazarite vow? What are the three rules? Can't drink. Don't cut your hair and don't touch dead bodies. So his Nazarite vow uh, is on the line here. So he reaches into this dead body and pulls out the honey because it is sweet. It is sweet. You can't tell me this has never happened to you. Anybody remember the story Pinocchio? There's a scene in there where he is dancing just before he gives himself completely over to his rumspringa, and he's telling himself and the world that He is not held back by the rules. He has no strings on him. Let's take a look at this clip. Go ahead. ahead. Make a fool fool of yourself. And maybe you'll 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 listen to your conscience. I 
There's that red Corvette again. <laughs> so, who have you cut your strings for? Who has been that influence in your life that you've compromised what you know God has asked you to do? I know you're not Nazarites. It's not about alcohol. It's not about hairstyle. It's not about touching dead bodies. But it is about knowing and trusting God's word, organizing your thoughts, your emotions, your life around God's truth. You know, in that little clip, you've got that big surly guy that's all excited when this innocent loses his innocence. Satan loves it when we cut our strings, when we begin to see the righteous way of living that God has put out in front of us, when we begin to see that it, it is not meant to be restrictive, it is meant to be protective. You, you need someone in your life who's in the passenger seat of your car who can speak truth to you, things that you may not want to hear. I, I talked to a friend, David Rawls. Uh, he was up at his cabin in, in uh, South Carolina. And we talked for about an hour on the phone the other day because he said, Jerry, I've been reading your posts and I hear your anger and I hear your disappointment. And he was just talking turkey to me. And I've given him permission to do that. Uh, somebody else I probably would have poked in the nose. I can take David two out of three falls. If you're watching, David, you know it's true. <laughs> but I gave him permission to say you're dancing the dance of Pinocchio. You are acting out of your arrogance. You're refusing wise counsel. You are going against the grain of Jesus Christ who competes and combats the wiles of Satan without using the ways of Satan. You know, Samson went ahead and he married this Philistine girl. And it's, it's like the Hatfields and McCoys. Read the story for yourself. I really encourage you to get into uh, this book of Judges. Read the story for yourself. Uh, his wife ends up with a groomsman. It's like one of those real TV movies, you know. Uh, and Samson gets mad, and he wants to get even. No, no, he doesn't want to settle for getting even. He wants to go nuclear. He wants to go nuclear. So here's how he does it. He went out and caught 300 foxes. How easy would that be? How mad would you have to be to go out and trap 300 foxes, right? I mean, with about the 50th, you go, oh, I'm you have to work up your anger again, right? But we do this. So he catches 300 foxes. He ties them tail to tail. How easy would that be? And then he fastens a torch to every pair of tails, and he turns them loose in the fields of the Pharisees, or the Philistines. So here's the deal. He has been injured by his wife and her family, and he decides to destroy the economy of a nation. God is not going to bless when you go nuclear. You need to build a protective space around your heart and around your life. You can say thus far and no farther, but that doesn't mean you destroy another individual. So the blind spots of arrogance and anger are often connected. They show up in Samson's life. Samson vows revenge because they kill. The Philistines kill his wife, his unfaithful wife, and her entire family. And he gets angry about that. You ever notice that his response to everything, whether it goes his way or against his way, he gets mad. You know somebody like that? Not a lot of fun to be around. And if you're that person, you can be someone else in Jesus Christ. So we wait for Samson to become this heroic person that he was born to be, this Nazarite, to become a Braveheart, a William Wallace, like Mel Gibson's movie. But he never quite gets there. He fulfills God's will for his life, but he does it with arrogance and anger. He's always selfish and petty. He's thin-skinned. He's slow to listen and quick to become mad. He is the epitome of arrogance. So back to the beginning as we finish this up. Who's the woman you think of when I say Samson? Delilah. She comes 20 years after this. And Samson is still Samson. 
He's still that young, arrogant man who gets mad at the drop of a hat. So he marries Delilah. She is bribed by the Philistines with this ridiculous sum of money because they want to get rid of this guy who's been a thorn in their side for 20 years. Uh, So she's bribed, and she agrees to betray her husband. So she, she goes to him, Samson, you need to tell me the source of your strength. Like you can't see through that, right? So, but she does it over and over again. It says she nagged him until <laughs> he finally gives in and he says, look, I'm not strong at all. My strength is the Lord. And it comes into my life because of my Nazarite vow. How faithful has he been to his Nazarite vow? Not very, Lisa says. Do you agree? And it's not just reaching into a lion, a dead carcass. You know where that dead carcass was? It was a winery. So he had violated already two of the three steps to his Nazarite vow. What's the one left? Hair. So that's why he tells her. He knows that he has violated his vow. He knows that the source of his strength is on the line, but in his arrogance, he thinks God will love him even when he is completely disobedient. And of course, God loves him, but he thinks he's going to have the same power, the same blessing, the same hedge of protection when he is just defying God in every possible way. And so he eventually tells her, it's my hair. You remember what she does? She gives him a haircut. Lila said, this is not the first time she said it. He told her all kinds of crazy things. But she says, Samson, the Philistines are on you. He awoke from his deep sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. Read the last sentence with me. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. What's the only thing that will drive the Lord's presence from your life? Sin unconfessed sin. You say, well, Jerry, that's not true. That is true. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, and you have that moment where he cries out in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Theologically, that is the moment in time all the sins of mankind were placed upon the Christ. The Bible assures us that sin cannot be in the presence of God. That is not some rhetorical twist. It's not some sort of a plot thing. Christ felt the one who before time and space was in eternal union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He felt the Father and the Holy Spirit withdraw. And he truly was alone, immersed in our sins because none of it was his. He was without sin. Samson had that moment here. He rose, and in his arrogance, he thought the Lord was with him, that the Lord was going to bless his willful sin. Let me read it one last time. The Lord had left him. A fear for this nation, a fear for the domination of Christianity. I fear for every Christian who thinks Samson didn't have what you have. My friends, you're not underneath the Nazarite vow. But in your baptismal covenant, you are underneath the witness of God in the Old and New Testament. Know it, trust it, live it. Amen? Communion is a beautiful way to remind ourselves that while we are a covenant people, we don't always get it right. Sometimes we think we let God down. The truth is you were never holding God up. It is the strength of God that comes to us through the Holy Spirit from the Christ. He who began a good work in you will complete it. It's not dependent upon your strength. Samson missed the boat. Don't you miss the boat. Allow yourselves to rise on the wings of an eagle, not beating your wings like a hummingbird, but trusting that the Spirit of God will help you soar.
Father, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for this hurting world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Would you please take the chalice that you received? On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. You have joined a covenant people. You are part of the way that leads to life. You have joined because of this, the body of Christ. So don't trust in your own goodness. Don't trust in your own intelligence. Trust in the love and the grace and mercy of God. So take and eat. We are one together in this one. And then he took the cup, and again he offered thanks, and he gave it to him, saying, Drink from this, all of you. There is none of us without sin. None of us gets it right. If you will open your hand and hold your truth in the grace of God, in the gentleness of the Christ, then you will not try to do combat with Satan and the forces of this world. So take and drink, trusting that the healing presence of Jesus Christ is at work in your body, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your relationships. Give up the sin and trust the Savior. Father God, we do accept that the stories in the Old Testaments are there as warnings. The implications of arrogance and anger is in each of our hearts. Help us, Father, to simply trust that what we have done and learned, what we've experienced through the power of communion, is enough to put our past behind us and to look forward to a beautiful day with you. In Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand and join us in singing our last song? Turn your eyes.
Independence Day weekend, trust. Trust in the one you can depend upon. Trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Trust in the work of grace, not just on Calvary's cross, but by the Holy Spirit that is here with us today. Go forth to live in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Stay safe. Come out of the 4th of July weekend with the same number of fingers you went in.